Okay, we will call the meeting to order now. I'm Jerry Griffin. I'm a member of the council, and um, I was called on late to uh, step in and do this today. I've got a script, uh, which Mary uh, Smith assures me is correct. So um, I hope I don't make uh, too many stumbles, but we'll get through this. And uh, Fred is going to join us at 11, and, um, and I think be uh, with us for the rest of the day. Um, Fred is in an interesting position. He, he is, his term has ended on the board, but he hasn't been replaced yet. Uh, and so theoretically, he's still on it. He's, so he's kind of in a, in a purgatory uh, situation. Um, I want to thank everybody for being here. Hi, Beth. Sorry. And that's okay. Just, we're just starting. Austin has more traffic than Houston. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> And uh, I want to thank everybody for their commitment. To the, this is our ninth meeting uh, of this uh, council. And um, so it's been going on a while, and, and uh, everybody's hung in, and, and uh, we're getting the job done. I think. Yes, you can. <laughs> um, as you're aware, we have two charges uh, as a council. One is identifying metrics for Texas international competitiveness by 2030. And developing, number two, developing a culture in Texas higher education dedicated to the continuous improvement of educational outcomes and the components necessary for Texas to be internationally competitive. The second charge includes identifying best practices in all areas of campus operations uh, that have demonstrated success. So to continue our work on these charges, each of you has a packet of hard copy materials for today. In the packet are today's meeting agenda, the minutes of our July 23rd meeting, the biographies of our presenters today, presentation and handouts in order of their appearance on our agenda. After considering the minutes from our July meeting, which will be next on the agenda, we'll hear from Dr. Chris to catch, and I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, Executive Director of the Office of Research and Institutional Effectiveness at Lone Star College System, and Dr. Ellen Wagner, Executive Director of the Western Interstate Commission for Higher Education's Cooperative for Educational Technology. Dr. Wagner will participate virtually with us today by telephone and will work with Dr. to catch to provide the council an overview of the predictive analysis, analytics, I'm sorry, reporting framework, and how that framework is being used by districts and colleges to enhance student success. After doctors uh, to catch in Wagner's presentation and our discussion, we'll consider the starting point for the next long range plan for higher education in Texas beyond closing the gaps by 2015 and the potential timeline for building consensus around a new long-range plan for Texas higher ed. After our presentation and discussion, our council will have lunch. The plan was to divide in two groups. There are few enough of us that I would like to propose that we just do that with one group. And um, uh, we'll meet for about an hour to further discuss and reach small group consensus on recommendations pertaining to the potential timeline. Each group, forget that, uh, will address the questions on the second page of the agenda. We'll then summarize and briefly discuss our recommendations. Unfortunately, I do need to let you know that Charles Matthews has decided to resign his position on the council due to his many other responsibilities and commitments. I want to express many thanks to Charles for being a part of this council from its beginning and contrib contrib contributing to its work. Okay, with that, we'll go ahead and get started. Do I have a motion to approve the minutes of our July meeting? Sure. So moved by Roberto, second by Beth. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? <clears throat> Hearing none, they are approved. Um, now, Program Director Melinda valdez Ellis will provide a brief summary of the Council's July meeting, including a synopsis of our small group discussions and recommendations. Melinda? Thank you. Good morning again, everyone. So from our July 24th summer meeting, uh, the council received a legislative update 
uh, efficiency and productivity best practices presentation, and also an update on closing the gaps by 2015 and beyond. Now, only one group discussion uh, occurred due to several members needing to depart early, and this group requested more time to review and develop comments to discuss uh, the questions posed to them, and they'll be doing that again today. Now, the questions posed to them in July first were, or was, uh, what would the groups add to our timeline for moving forward with beyond closing the gaps? Uh, what would the groups delete from the potential timeline? And what additional recommendations regarding the proposed schedule to develop consensus and secure institutional feedback on the potential goals and the prospective measurable targets associated with each of the goals? And as I said before, uh, the group requested more time to review and develop comments, which again, we will we'll revisit today. And that's your summary. Very good. Any questions of uh, Melinda? We'll, we'll hit a lot of that again uh, when we have lunch. Okay, thank you. Now it's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Chris DeKatch and Dr. Ellen Wagner, and I assume Dr. Wagner is on. Um, I am on the phone, sir. I'm here. Good, thank you. Given the ground we have to cover in a limited time, and given you all have full biographies in your handout materials, I'm just going to provide a very brief introduction for the, our presenters this morning. Dr. Takach is the Executive Director of the Office of Research and Institutional Effectiveness at Lone Star College System. He oversees the offices of Institutional Research, Enterprise Reporting Systems, and Institutional Effectiveness. Dr. Wagner is the Executive Director of the WICHI, I think I'm pronouncing that right, Cooperative for Educational Technologies, W-I-C-H-E. Dr. Wagner is the former Senior Director of Worldwide E-Learning, Adobe Systems, Inc., and was the Senior Director of Worldwide Education Solutions for Macromedia, Inc. Before joining the private sector, Dr. Wagner is, was a tenured professor and chair of the Educational Technology Program at the University of Northern Colorado. Dr. Takach, thank you for joining us here today. And Dr. Wagner, thank you for joining us by telephone from your conference in Las Vegas. We're pleased to have you. you. Well, I'm delighted to be here with you this morning. And um, I do uh, thank Chris for his assistance as we get going. So uh, with that, Chris, I believe you were, you were going to get us started. Yeah, there yeah, right. you go. Well, I appreciate the time and uh, allowing us to come and present our information. I will be Dr. Wagner's also uh, slide forwarder. That's <laughs> so we're going to be saying. Thank you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see how that works out. Uh, the presentation is really all about uh, KPIs, key performance indicators, analysis, uh, particularly predictive analysis, and the use of analysis in going from um, data to action. <laughs> It's really all about helping students and in the whole process making things better continually for students. Um, a couple of years ago, we were taking a look at the momentum points as being proposed by the coordinating board. We loved the idea, thought it was fantastic incentivizing, doing well for our students. Um, but we also realized that with KPIs, there's a shortcoming. It's very high level. And what we need really to do is dig deeper. Uh, into the data. So what we did was uh, we joined uh, PAR, Predictive Analytics Research, in order for us to bridge that gap from analysis to action. And Dr. Wagner is going to be talking about the PAR piece, <coughs> and then later on, after uh, Dr. Wagner, I'll be basically talking about how we're using the data and how it's used at Lone Star. So without any further ado, Dr. Wagner. Well. Thank you so much, and good morning to everyone. I really appreciate the opportunity to come and speak with you this morning about the PAR framework. Um, as we get started, I just want to um, give you a little bit of context for why we at the Western Interstate Commission found ourselves involved in a big data project. And with that, Chris, if you could move to the, the post-secondary education and the new normal slide, please. One of the things that we do at WICHE, uh, which is how it is pronounced, uh, the Western Interstate Commission, 
we are involved in interstate compact work to increase access, affordability, and availability of educational resources in the Western United States. WICHE is one of four interstate compact organizations that the U.S. Congress uh, mandated back about 60 years ago. And we in, in WICHE, if you were to take a line from the Dakotas and divide the country over to New Mexico, so we miss Texas, but we would cover everything from the Dakotas west. As you can imagine, those of us who have been working in that particular entity have found ourselves dealing with um, a lot of new media and technologies, but we do so in, in, in the purpose of trying to respond to making sure that the people who live in our western states actually have access to the types of educational resources that they need for economic competitiveness um, uh, within the United States and across the world. As we all know, in the last number of years, we've all had to respond to new pressures. The idea that there are demands for accountability that we've always understood, but I think now have become even more real than we'd probably ever imagined it would have to be, uh, really looking when we say words like effectiveness and efficiency, what metrics are we actually using? Uh, we're also finding in the same time that people want to know how we come up with these numbers and how we come up with the judgments from those numbers. So the idea of transparency is certainly clear. And we've also started to see a lot of new emerging models of education and training that are purporting to address some of the shortcomings that people have seen around uh, post-secondary education systems. I will tell you, I'm, I focus more specifically on post-secondary, so um, I just want to make sure that my, that my orientation there is clear. And the idea that there is more competition than we've ever had before in post-secondary education is one of those strange and unusual opportunities where educators typically don't think in terms of competitive advantage. We think in terms of our practice, or we think in terms of our discipline. The idea that we must be accountable is, is unavoidable. As we move to the next slide, I just grabbed a few uh, examples of why I know you are all ever so mindful about these types of, uh, of bullet points here on this slide, where the cost of a college degree is increasing higher than just about any other uh, cost sector we are seeing in the U.S. We all understand that student debt now has topped a trillion dollars, a uh, significant amount of money. And, of course, we're looking at all of those expenses at a time when graduation rates are continuing to take longer and longer. So for many of us, trying to really focus on efficiencies in areas about how do we control costs and how do we focus on uh, retention and completion is absolutely core to our, our ongoing activities. In the next slide, you're going to see another large looming force that many of us are responding to, and this is the notion of performance-based funding. Making sure that the performance of institutions are tied to metrics that are then translated into funding is, it is a logical way to think about conducting one's business. But of course, when one is also dealing with the perception of, of, of maintaining the common good while maintaining competitiveness, we are all finding ourselves in the state really having to think very differently about how it is that we demonstrate our value to our constituencies. The next slide, the Are You Data Ready slide, is something that we are starting to see. Many of you are aware of the college scorecard that the U.S. Department of Education has launched to make it easier for people to find a college that fits the type of guidelines that they're looking for in their particular life. What's been interesting for us is the recognition that perhaps 85% of today's college students do not fit the standard definition of an incoming full-time freshman falling between the, age, the ages of 18 to 22. And when we, just, when we really consider that these scorecards are typically based on that particular norm, the traditional college students, and we understand now that most college students don't look like the 18 to 22-year-olds. Most of us are working adults. Many of us are part-time students. Many of us are coming in from the military or coming in from other professional environments where we bring lots of experience with us, making sure that we are able to reflect all of that knowledge and experience when looking at what one can do in the college experience is really starting to test our ability to, to, to think outside the normal boundaries within which we've conducted our practice for so long. 
with that in mind, we at Witchy have found ourselves really moving into, if you will, if you will the data business, uh, making data matter. If you get to this next slide, you will see that there are five points of action that we have been finding ourselves addressing very specifically within this project called the Predictive Analytics Reporting Framework. The PAR framework emerged about three years ago. It's a, it's a relatively new project, and it was an idea that came from within the members of the cooperative, the technology cooperative that I direct for Wichi. The question was basically one of, well, what if we looked at our data really differently? What if we as practitioners, and this, this group talking were about oh, people from about six different colleges and universities uh, that are members of this association, and the conversation was, one of realizing that if we wanted to come up with different answers and different insights, we were probably going to have to look at the information we were dealing with in very different ways. So from that, we proposed and were funded to take on a project called the Predictive Analytics Reporting Framework. I've moved on to the next slide now, Chris. What this is is a big data analysis that we developed to identify drivers related to student loss and momentum and to better inform us about what is going on in this big, murky arena of student loss so that we could do a better job of anticipating where problems are going to be and get out ahead of them rather than waiting for things to need intervention, if you will. We wanted to look at this somewhat more proactively. What we did was somewhat unusual. We, we had um, a number of institutions volunteer to share all of their de-identified, anonymized student information so that we could create a single federated data set of all this information, thus allowing us to do the types of predictive analyses that many of us have come to expect when we deal in so many of the other sectors of, of the American economy, whether we're doing our online shopping or we are working in telecommunications where the tracking of call volume is uh, a significant part of high quality or even looking at em em employing churn or um, inventory management. So many of these types of environments have lent themselves so nicely to use of big data uh, and different ways of dealing with business intelligence. The education sector has remained apart from much of that conversation for lots of really good reasons, not the least of which was that they didn't really have the data resources that we could use for doing multi-institutional work. So it was very exciting that we had uh, to begin, we had six institutions that were the brave, the brave ones that started to see if we could actually get this idea to work. And once we did, we approached and were funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to bring on additional partners. Um, so we had 16 schools that we were working with where we would ingest all of their data into the single data set. We would do analyses, and we would start looking for these new patterns that would inform us about student loss. Um, in the next slide, you will see the objectives. This was not necessarily a research project. Sometimes when I talk about this effort, um, and I'm, I am reminded of this as I am here in Las Vegas and I am looking out over the desert, um, realizing that PAR in some respects is a little bit more like a Hoover Dam project. We, uh, we, we wanted to make sure that we as a community could come together bottoms up and start building something that was bigger than all of us so that once we developed this resource, we would be able to then have that resource be available to the institutions that have participated in its construction. So for us, we were coming up with common variables. What are the variables likely to influence retention and progression? And try to get an actual measurement of what that degree of influence was. The other thing that we wanted to do in building out predictive models was to start looking at what happens when we put disparate types of schools in a common data set. We understand that of the 4,000-plus accredited institutions that there are going to be lots and lots of differences, but what happens when we actually start putting everybody together? Um, once we do that, can we find places where there are material differences in the quality and the service that we provide? And then finally, we wanted to start looking to see, you know, if we could in fact predict where a student was going to be at risk, probably the biggest question for us was, well, what are you going to do? once you know that there is risk. And the idea of being able to deal with the now what problem, it was a little startling for us, and it sounds almost naive to say this three years later, but when we started this work, we believed that the opportunity to predict 
the students at risk was the most important thing we could do. What we discovered very quickly is once you know who those students are, there is an obligation to address the needs that they have. So knowing what to do about the predicted um, uh, situation of loss, that was probably as important, if not more so, than even knowing where the risk was. So moving to the next slide, I just wanted to show you who we have been working with over this last couple of years. Um, to the point of the, of the differentiated model, we included for-profit institutions, uh, four-year state-funded schools. We've got a couple of private schools in here. We wanted four-year and we wanted community colleges. We've also included um, what we call progressive institutions, institutions like the Western Governors University that is based on competency-based learning and assessment rather than traditional courses. If we were able to get those first 16 schools to work, we believed that we would be able to bring on other institutions, and that is, in fact, uh, what we've been finding right now. You will notice that there are four new partners named um, in fall 2013. We have, in fact, just um, brought those. We are just now bringing these schools on, um, but the idea here is um, well, I mentioned Western Governors University specifically around their competency-based learning. Two of the new incoming schools, um, Excelsior College and Northern Arizona University, have both been re have recently been approved for offering competency-based learning. So for us, being able to look at how we can crosswalk through the entire post-secondary ecosystem, figuring out where the opportunities were, where the differences were, where barriers might be, so that we would be in a better position to provide students with information just seemed like the right thing to do. Now, I'm going to stop right now um, and see if there might be any questions in the room. It's a little tough for me here since I can't actually see. Um, look, you eyeball to eyeball, but um, I'd like to take a quick pause here and see if any questions about anything I've said so far. Any questions? No questions. Okay. Uh, I, I, I have them. just okay. one uh, very small one. There's some asterisks oh, sure. asterisk on that institutional partner uh, chart. And what does that refer to? Are those public? Those were the original partners. And I'm sorry that that was not asterisk, that there is not a little legend on the page. <coughs> those first that you see with the asterisk were the ones that said, oh, we'll do it. Those are the ones that volunteered first. Okay. What, what I will point out to you in that group, when we started doing the predictive analytics work, we, we worked with a number of institutions, the American Public University System and the University of Phoenix, both of them being for-profit institutions. Both of them had made fairly significant investment into their own institutional predictive platform. What they were finding in doing their work was that they were doing a fine job looking inside their own institution, but what they could not do was to look outside and see if what they were doing uh, had any relevancy whatsoever outside. Well, on one hand, that might be just fine from a competitive standpoint. Maybe all you really need to know about is your own work. But, of course, we're talking students. We're not really talking about products. And students transfer, and students need to have opportunities where maybe if they're not in the right institution in the first go-round, well, can we figure out why it's not right? Can we find a better place where they'd be more successful? So uh, with that in mind, working with um, the number of other institutions, um, Rio Salado College had also, um, uh, uh, Rio Salado is the online institution for the Maricopa Community College system. Um, they had started doing some of their own predictions. So what we had going on was a really unusual experience in post-secondary education, which is all these educators from all these different sectors got together in the same room. And I know Chris was a participant in this meeting. We all got together and, and promising one another that we would protect one another's uh, privacy. We would protect one another's integrity. We would not be going forward and uh, using these data to compare and contrast ourselves with one another, but that we would, as educators, make a commitment to figuring out if we could take a look at these data and really get new insights about what it is that students need. So um, I, 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 won't, I won't continue on that. I'll, I'll, I could probably keep going for a while, but I think we'll move on to the next slide, which has um, uh, we do have about one what more. we've been doing in part. Oh, of course. We do have one more question. And, and I'm, I hate that this is Beth Robertson, and I'm a, a, a total layperson on this board. So uh, help me uh, here. Are you saying that the, the data that you're collecting these various institutions are taking a look at student A, B, or C and saying, well, this is predictive if they will or they will not be successful here, and therefore we will 
accept them uh, or we will let them know that they are probably have not a very good chance of being successful. I, I'm a little confused at when you get the data, what do you do with it? And, and that'll be uh, my piece, but we are not, when it comes to acceptance, we are, at Lone Star, we're open door, everyone comes in. And it's more in terms of, for us, um, identifying students who may have some specific needs that need to be met and offering them services, um, such as tutoring, et cetera. Um, it's, a little, it's certainly not about um, determining for the student what they should be doing, but rather uh, informing our own services, et cetera, where the need might be. Do, do you show the student this data? Currently, no. We're just using that to set up our own services, et cetera. Okay. I was just, I was curious. Sure. Well, we don't show the data to the student yet because when we started looking at the places where we believed we were likely to have the greatest impact in this work, and remembering that this was really the first time that a bunch of colleges and universities got together, volunteered to do something that had never been done before, uh, with most people telling us, well, you know, you probably can't do that because no one will share their data. In fact, we discovered that when you get a bunch of determined educators in a room together, you can pretty much move mountains if, if you're smart and thoughtful about how you do it. So for us getting started, looking at institutional data, where we knew we could go to each one of these institutions, and they could, with pretty much 100% assurance show us that they had information on every one of the variables that we were tracking. It was one of the first times that we actually found ourselves working with common data definitions that were relevant across multiple institutions. To Chris's point, the community colleges with whom we have been working uh, all have open-door policies. We don't have uh, restricted admissions. Some of the uh, Re Research One institutions that are a part of the sample, including the Penn State University and the University of Central Florida, do in fact restrict who they admit. So as you can imagine, the need to support students on those campuses doesn't necessarily look the same thing. Um, University of Central Florida, even the University of Phoenix, does not have anywhere near the interest or the need for developmental education or the types of, of hardcore support services for first-time um, college students that you might find in the community colleges. So for us, it was also trying to get past the idea of one-size-fits-all interventions that will work for everybody, because we've just found that that's not necessarily true. To the point of getting to the student advising, it is possible, and Chris will show you as we go ahead, that advisors do have the opportunity to look at individual student information so that they will know who is at risk, and they will know that, in fact, one can provide support and solutions for that. The next logical step is going to be making sure that the students can see their data so that they can self-correct as well. But I will tell you all, just from the idea of working within institutions, and we have focused on institutions since the institutional members are the ones who are having their feet held to the fire right now, if we can show how an institution is, in fact, responding to populations at risk and we can measure the impact of the work that they are doing, we have an opportunity to help focus on issues related to public policy in ways that we have not yet seen possible when dealing at the pedagogical level institution by institution, which is not to say that we're not going to do it. But we found ourselves realizing that if we couldn't get the institution's to align around these ideas, that the opportunity for going into single institutions and doing the work was great because those schools um, and advising to the students will, in fact, um, be able to, you know, everybody really benefits from that coaching. We will be at that point, but we've figured that to get the institutions on board, we needed to help the institutions be successful first. So it is a more a matter of timing than it is a matter of intention. So hopefully that background helps a little bit. Uh my name is Roberto Sarte. I'm a trustee with the Alamo Colleges in San Antonio. And doing this work, I was wondering um, if you had done anything to, uh, for community colleges, done any work in terms of uh, disaggregating the data so that you can figure out the intent of community college students as they come into our system. And let me tell you why I'm asking that question. One of the uh, roles that I have as a trustee is to try to, to make decisions in terms of policy and, and fiscal matters. But as we look at uh, the cohorts that we uh, that generate the data for us, uh, 
we have we're having a hard time determining what constitutes completion. For example, if a student comes in and wants a, uh, a complete uh, an associate's degree, has a degree plan, no problem. But there's some students that come in and they just want to take one year, uh, whether it be for a certificate or just one year of, of college experience. There's some that come in and just take a semester. Uh, and we're, it, it, it skews our data in terms of completion. So uh, we're really looking at uh, trying to see if we can formalize some metric that will help us with intent. So have you done any work in that area? I'm I was able to hear part of your question, and, I'm, and I apologize for that. Um, we are actually taking a look at many of, of those types of data. M may I ask your indulgence? I'd, I'd like to run through the presentation, and I'm, I'm okay. apologizing because I only heard part of what you wanted. But hold your question. I think when you see how we have been collecting the data, that some of this will become clear. And I think to your point, I, I, I heard the part where you're talking about somebody coming in, taking a class in a semester, and you know, coming in and out, we actually are keeping track of um, when they come in, when they leave, what counts as a withdrawal, what doesn't. And in fact, that's where a lot of the common definitional work that we were needing to do right up front um, was focused. So um, perhaps as I go ahead and show you a little bit about what we have been collecting and what we've been working with, we could come back to your question, because I think we've got what you're asking for, um, but... but um, I guess we'll, we'll find out very quickly. Would, would that work? Yes, I will. Thank you. Sure, you bet. Well, in fact, with that in mind, let me take a quick look and show you what we have been doing with the, with the PAR framework. And I'm just going to do the build, right? Um, Chris, if you could move it forward. There are all little, um, lots of clicks on this. But I'm going to say, why don't you just put the whole, all the clicks up. And by the time you see the word retain, everything will be up on the screen. So go beyond PAR framework? Yeah, I would say that there are, on that PAR framework slide, it is a build slide, and so you will have, uh, the diagram will be built as you click it. So it will start with PAR framework on the top and scalable cross uh, institutional improvements across the bottom, and then there will be an orange half dome with two blue bars underneath it. Yep, you're there. Uh, you're all, all the way to the point of retain. Excellent. Well, thank you. So the, the basic approach to the work, and this is all predicated on having the data, so um, what it allowed us to do was to have a foundation for multi-institutional collaboration, this multi-institutional lens where institutions have agreed together that what they're talking about all mean the same thing. So we are doing apples-to-apples -apples comparison. The common definition of terms and common definition of intervention. Again, this is not that we are declaring it top-down so. What we are doing is working within the models themselves and... Um, finding ways to make this work. So well, getting 16 institutions and a core team agreeing on things like definitions of interventions, it, this is where the research has gone on, but we're doing a lot of research and testing. So the foundation is built on, on commonality. Uh, we're not looking for the outliers here so much as we want to have a framework so that outliers within that framework can be more easily identified. It is predicated on the fact that we have built predictive model, and Chris is going to show you some of what these look like at Lone Star. We create student watch lists for targeted interventions that we are tracking, and I will tell you that we've had probably about 600 interventions identified within our institutional partners that we are now in the process of um, normalizing, defining, um, making sure that we are all talking about the same things, doing some cluster analyses on these, uh, so that we can start doing field tests on those interventions in different environments so we can actually see what the impact is. And from those results, we are able to, in fact, identify the 25 students most likely to not pass Math 101. I mean, it, it, it's, pretty, it, it, it's, pretty, it's uh, pretty direct. In fact, I'm going to move on to the next slide, Chris, which talks about the structured and readily available data. The common definitions that we have used help make meaningful comparisons. We have openly published all of these data definitions, even though we use them entire, inside our project, we've realized that um, what we are doing is of interest to, interest to many other people. So we, we openly published this using Creative Commons licensing um, this past February. Since that time, we've had probably a thousand institutions download the definitions to start taking a look at what they can do 
to help bring some sense to the different types of data projects, even on their own campuses. Um, and again, this is not to define how the projects go. This is literally defining the ways in which the variables are coded and contained in the analysis system. So um, we've got the link right there if anybody were interested in taking a look at it. Um, this comes back to the question about the PAR data inputs, and we've categorized them in broad categories. I will tell you that um, we're working with 77 variables right now. We have chosen these 77 not because they are necessarily the best ones, and I say best in quotation marks, because that, of course, is somewhat contingent on where um, where you're using the data. But what we have found is that all of these 77 are available at every one of the 16 schools that has been our, been participating, and all of the data points that we collect around those variables are available for every single one of the students in this data set. And I should tell you that the size of this data set is, is not insignificant. We are now including, um, there are just over 2 million students that are a part of this data set, and we are collecting data on um, more than 13.2 million courses in which those students are enrolled. So it's a fairly significant data set. Um, we are collecting student demographic information. Some of it's just descriptive, so you can see the types of things there, gender, race, prior credits, um, the resident zip code, um, trying to do what we can to try to get a sense of, of incoming information. Not every institution collects high school data. So while we've recognized that high school data for admissions is going to be important, that was one of the things that not everybody collected. So uh, we didn't go that route in this first couple of go-rounds. Uh, we do collect information about the course, um, the location, the subject number, section, um, the type of delivery mode. People are very, very curious about the online, blended, face-to-face -face quality questions. When we started this, we actually started with the focus in the online arena because it was the easiest place to get more complete information. Fairly quickly, we discovered that, well, students, students are not either online. I mean, students are not just online. Students take courses wherever they can get the courses. So if we were focusing on students, we couldn't just focus on modality. We needed to take a look at all the ways in which students take their courses. So this is for um, all courses, you know, whether it's delivered on campus in a blended format or online. Um, we are getting and starting to get more student financial aid information. Uh, we know that uh, financial aid information, uh, Pell status, for example, tends to be highly predictive. We look for their academic progress. We're even doing things like looking at the course catalogs and looking for toxic course combinations. I mean, sometimes people don't do well and you can actually see the courses that they've taken don't give them the prerequisites. Well, when you can do that one by one, it's great. If you can do that on a scalable basis, it's even better. You can find yourself looking at ways to rearrange curricula so that you don't get people into dead-end um, programs of study. Um, the lookup tables, we've really needed to make sure that when we are doing these crosswalks that we've got ways for everyone to refer back to what they're doing, back to, um, to the, the, the master core file. And as I mentioned, this is a, progress, uh, this is a, 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 pro a project in progress. Um, we've been at it about three years. We've just signed new schools. We are moving into doing some new um, measuring over this next coming year. So the addition of new variables um, is absolutely on our roadmap. In fact, much of the work that we're doing right now is, even in talking with groups such as yourself, finding out some of the things that are the most pressing types of variables so that we can start factoring that into our own road plan. Um, I'm moving to the next slide on some of the outputs. What we get from this are institutional, the, the big institutional data set that I mentioned to you. We are able to provide our institutional members with reflective institutional reports. In some cases, they've never seen the data being reported to them um, as being collected in these ways. We have started at working on the cross-institutional benchmarks so that we know what it is that institutions are being held accountable for, and we can give them a way to see if they're um, measuring up. In fact, the the PAR name, um, for those of you who are golfers, of course, you know, PAR was chosen somewhat deliberately. It is about predictive analytics. However, it's also trying to give people a measure of how they're stacking up relative to their peers, where they need to be able to spend some time doing some improvement. Um, the aggregate models have allowed us to do very highly customized predictive models for each of the partners. And um, creating watch lists, so back to the question about do the students see this, 
Right now, the advisors can see this, and we are getting ready to, in fact, share these data with advisors. Advisors would be in a position to share this information with students. So there's nothing, there's nothing about this that is being held back from anybody. Um, mostly, we just want to make sure that it continues to be actionable. What we're finding right now is that the opportunity for institutions to really focus on where they're getting the biggest bang for their intervention investment is highly appealing. And of all, m- many of the things that we've been doing right now, this intervention work has really captured people's attention because they're spending real dollars on things that they're doing to help keep students in school. Um, the policy issues for us are significant. Obviously, when you're working at a place like Wichi, policy drives much of our work. But we understand that while every institution is going to be working on their own competitiveness, there is a point when we're talking education that we do talk <coughs> state-level policy. We do talk federal policy. Um, so making sure that we are able to have those conversations becomes a significant part of our work, and then ultimately being able to make comparative interventions. Um, it's really going to help us get a lot smarter what we can actually do for the students to keep them in school longer. Um, the next slide will give you an idea of some of the sample benchmarks that, that we're starting to build so that we can start drilling down on the entry year. We've been collecting three years' worth of data. We're not going back that much further yet because we're not finding that the predictive strength for students that are out of school is really the point. Um, but you get a chance to see the types of things that we're looking at and then how they will start um, being reported back so that we can see these in in um, an aggregate report. Um, the next slide will give you a taste for what these actionable predictive models look like. Um, this is um, actually, as you will recognize, this is um, a, a snapshot from some um, Lone Star data. And it will show you the ways in which, you know, we have used this passing math uh, 306 as the as the example for this particular dashboard. One can choose um, any number of variables, as you can see on this, on this slide. The radio button will allow you to customize this for um, all students. The slider bars, if you look over in the top right, um, right corner, you'll see the ages from 17 to 66. Well, right now we're looking at the to- we would be looking at a total snapshot, a total picture of the entire population. What if you wanted to just take a look at what happens for um, students over 40? Or if you wanted to take a look at the students, um, female students who are um, uh, Hispanic, uh, majoring in a particular area, you know, so you can really literally drill down to um, that level of specificity. And once you get to that level, when you click on the bar, which I will not be doing here since this is not a live um, a live screen, it literally gets down to the point of each individual student whose records have helped build the model. We on the PAR team do not know who those students are. We, we, we decouple the student identifying information before we get it so that when we're working with the data, we really don't know anything about the students other than the, the data points that we're looking at. Every institution that shares their data has the code so they can go back and reconnect the data analyses that we're looking at with the students themselves. So puts the power back in the schools, and it makes sure that we, we keep ourselves out of the issues related to privacy. We've been pretty concerned about that. Um, the next slide will just give you a quick snapshot on, I, I referred to the, the use of interventions um, and really tracking the interventions and the efficacy of those interventions. We have literally been logging and tracking and mapping the interventions that our partners use at the institutions. I mentioned the number 600. You know, sometimes as we start looking at the labels on these interventions, we discover some are fairly similar, but in other cases we're finding that um, the student orientation has certain types of requirements um, that might be different than uh, an orientation to a part of a program a little bit later on. So we're, we're, we're trying to not do a lot of judging. We're just doing the, the curating at the moment. What this, what this graph will show you are across the top, the different stages that we have pulled from the academic literature on the subject to come up with a model that actually speaks to the, 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 the process that students go through completing a course. And it seems to um, work as well for completing a program of study. The predictor behaviors that are noted down on the left side of this graph are things around which we as educators are going to actually have some control. You know, there's not a lot we can do about one's demographic profile, 
per se. But what we can do is we can look at behavioral characteristics that are being repeated or that are demonstrated and use those so that what we're tracking on the behaviors are things we can actually change. And we look at that across the student life cycle. And then inside all those empty boxes that you're looking at right now, this is where we are taking those 600-plus interventions and are actually starting to create maps of where these things are being used in the student life cycle. So we get a sense of where are they being used, what are they being used for. And now we're starting in on, in fact, I've just started field tests on doing some of the intervention testing. So we can take a look at developmental education activities that are taking place in some of our community college partners um, to see the types of, of impact and efficacy that they are starting to have. It's um, Again, this is where it gets into the research part where uh, we are exceedingly mindful about making sure that our research is being done uh, effectively and using all the different types of methods that we know will stand the scrutiny of our peers. But we're also doing something else, which is really asking permission. You know, an institution may not want to be benchmarked against another. They might not necessarily feel comfortable doing that, in which case we're not going to force that conversation. But what we have found among the collaboration of this uh, of this institutional partner team is that there are some schools that are saying, well, we'd like to work with you and we'd like to start comparing what we can do to get a little bit better. And so that type of work is starting to take place. Um, this um, success matrix has been, uh, again, openly published. This has been downloaded, I think, by another 800 We've been thrilled that um, the Gates Foundation has found this part of our work so useful that they have actually asked us to support another project that they have funded um, that will be involving, I believe, three or four uh, Texas institutions. And so we know that PAR is going to be, um, that these data definitions and the student success matrix are going to start being used uh, at South Texas College, Austin Community College. Uh, University of Texas San Antonio, and of course, uh, continue to work with our our colleagues and partners at Lone Star. So, just quickly, and going to the next slide, we are starting to test this intervention effectiveness. Um, at the four-year institutions, does peer mentoring um, make a difference uh, with the students earning a grade of C or better? And at the community colleges, uh, do similar uh, developmental education approaches uh, yield the same types of results? You know, for some of them, we just don't know. So. Um, that is to be, be proactive and start taking a look at it. Um, moving on to the slide with the picture of the mortar board in Castle, um, I just wanted to share some reflections of the project um, director who is uh, running this our project. Um, Beth Davis is, um, we're very, very lucky to have Beth. Um, this is, in spite of the focus on student success, as you can probably imagine, there is a lot of technology driving this, a lot of analytics work. Um, I will tell you all that we are using standard types of platforms and technology in our work. Uh, this is not about creating new technology. We understand that new technology is pretty exciting. Um, our, our goal has been to try to find ways of coming up with these new insights without requiring institutions to go off and buy a whole bunch of new stuff. So we're using, um, uh, we're using SAS. We're using SPSS. We're using Oracle. We're using... Um, we're working with companies like Starfish, Retention Solutions, and Elucian, and Blackboard, uh, familiar names if you are working in the education platform world, so that we can make sure we are doing crosswalks um, across the platform. But ultimately, the work is predicated on the fact that if we do not know, as you can see on this slide, if we don't have common diagnoses for the problems, it's almost impossible to come up with treatments. Thinking in the medical standpoint, we've sometimes even talked about how sometimes we find ourselves in student success putting the metaphorical Band-Aid on a metaphorical headache and then wondering why nothing happened. So in our world, without these agreed-upon treatments for these common diagnoses, it's going to be very difficult for any of us in education to start measuring the efficacy of the work that we're doing. Again, we, we know that it works anecdotally. Do we have evidence to show that it works? Well, you know, sometimes. One of the big insights is even discovering among the most sophisticated of our data, data institutions, fewer people actually measure the impact and efficacy than you might think. And it's not because we don't care. It's just that we're finding that we don't have ways of doing those common measures. So the focus on definitions has really been fundamental and, and, and super, super important for us. I think ultimately the worst thing that happens if we can't measure efficacy is that it's impossible to scale our work. 
And for all that we talk about transformation in education, what is inferred in that is that we will be able to scale the work that we do. And if we're all not talking about the same thing, scaling gets to be a pretty difficult proposition. So ultimately, if we don't have that framework, we still continue to find ourselves guessing about what works best. And we've all believed, and I think this is really what what motivated us as a team to come together, uh, we believe that it's past the time when we can afford to be guessing about what it is we can do for students. We have we have an obligation. If we let the institutions and in, uh, the students in our institutions, we have an obligation to make sure that we do the best we can to make sure that they are successful. So with that, I would move to the final slide, um, which is really the whole reason we're doing the work that we're doing. Uh, we want to make sure that helping students succeed is not just a catchphrase or a buzzword. Um, and that we want to make sure that when we're talking student success, that when we say the word scaling, that we actually mean it, that we actually can provide that value. So I believe that that should be uh, yes, the, the last slide there, my, my snowflake slide. Always a reminder that um, as much as we are looking for commonalities among us, that in fact one of the things that's been rather glorious is, is really seeing the degree of the uniqueness of the institution. There are reasons that there are institutions that we have with so many different types of students and student needs. Um, it's actually rather exciting to see that there are opportunities for, for all of us to achieve the dream of the, the college education that, that, we, that we hope to achieve. So with that, um, I believe my part of this is, is completed. Uh, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I do have a, a quick question. I know you're handling an awful lot of data in it, and it comes from universities or systems or whatever, and I, I suspect I know the answer to my own my question here, but ha have you run into uh, any privacy um, roadblocks um, on, on sharing this data? And it's probably more for Chris to answer back at an institution, but <clears throat> when you have so many, I think this is great because I'm a data guy myself, but in, oh, in, that's try, great. <laughs> in trying to figure out exactly how to use it is always interesting. <clears throat> but I, I just wonder if you've run up against any roadblocks where people say, well, look, I don't want you looking over my shoulder and intervening and, and, and then that kind of thing. Is there any yeah. of that? Well, all of the colleges went through uh, general counsel uh, in order to make sure that what we're sending out is you know, proper. Also, the information sent out to PAR is de-identified, so um, there it can't be tra tracked back to the student. So okay, good. I, I knew that answer. I just wanted to make sure it, <laughs> yeah. uh, it, I was right. To, Understood. Yep, yeah, yeah. To Chris's point, we did a couple things. We've actually <laughs> tried to. Uh, our project director talks in terms of how uh, for, so for so much of this around the student data security and privacy, uh, we wear our belt and our suspenders. We want to make sure that uh, that we are. Uh, being really, really safe with this. But to Chris's point, we, we have a couple things. Every institution that participates in the project is a volunteer. So, you know, we're not dealing with the idea of crossed arms and locked knees here. I mean, people have said, we want to be a part of this. And so the idea of resistance has not necessarily been an issue for us because we are, this is not mandated. This is a volunteer effort. The other thing is that we have required that all institutions sign a memorandum of, of, of agreement, to Chris's point, and um, it's, a fairly, it's a fairly detailed legal document, and it outlines all the ways in which we can and cannot use the information, how we will and will not work with one another. Um, so, you know, we've all promised one another face-to-face -face that, that we're going to do this the right way, but, you know, we've got the legal agreements to make sure that there's teeth in that, um, in that agreement that we've made. The other thing that we do is to make sure that every institution that participates in PAR has, uh, goes through an IRB review so that we are conforming to every institution's requirements for how uh, human subjects research is being conducted. In most cases, I think for 15 of the 16, it was, um, they were expedited. Uh, so, it, you know, it's been fairly straightforward because of the ways in which we've been protecting the data. But, you know, we, we come from the academy and we know that we must attend to the academy's rules. And so we have been following all the rules for uh, human subjects research that we can make sure that we, in fact, address either the direct or the inferred questions that might be when you're, when you're talking about data sets of this size and complexity. 
Uh, one last question. Uh, do the and and I'm sorry. I'm I'm trying to picture how you're collecting this. Are you collecting? Um, are the the students populating this this questionnaire or something, or is it something that you are actually picking out of of their um, you know the data you know that, that you have in in in, in the applications? Pre-existing data that we it's already have. It's existing data that's yes. already there. So. Right. It's pre-existing data. It's coming at this point from the student information system because, again, we're looking for the, the broadest institutional reach. We will be working with LMS data more actively in this next year. I mean, I, I think I, I mentioned to you that we chose not to do it in the first go-round just because every LMS is set up slightly differently on every single campus. And since we were looking for the commonalities, we decided to not start with the more difficult parts first. We wanted to go with the places we knew we could be successful and we could build up to it. So it's, um, it, it, it is focused on the SIS data, and we have been going back for several years' worth of information, but not going back too far because ultimately for us, if we're tracking these students and we want to make sure that we're tracking completion, uh, going back 20 years hasn't necessarily been giving us but that gives us an historical snapshot. It's, it's less useful for uh, the, the type of diagnosis and um, analyses that we're looking at right now. And I think Chris is probably going to be able to talk much more about this when he when he describes what they've been doing at Lone Star. Right. Good. And building off of uh, what Ellen was talking about, this is still, uh, to a certain extent, in its infancy. And I'd like to kind of alter my uh, tack a little bit on my, my slides to... Uh, Perhaps speed it up a little bit, but also to make sure that I've addressed uh, your two important questions a little bit as well, uh, because I think they are very important. One of the uh, takeaways of all of this, though, is um, we, we're being very intentional in our use of the data, and we're building it in, into an infrastructure of use of the data. So even as a data guy, I understand that a report is not going to solve the problem. Rather, what we have to do is we've got to take that report um, have it be informative to decision makers and then really facilitate that move from analysis to action to impacting the students and for continuous Im improvement back again. So one of the key pieces to all of that is the KPI because it allows us a common metric that we can share and have apples to apples comparison. And also you see that we were 16 colleges collaborating together. It allows for collaboration. And I'm finding uh, more and more as in, in my role, IR offices, colleges, et cetera, are all stepping up and saying, it's less about my institution, it's more about the students, let's share our information, and that KPI, the KPIs and co a common metric allows that really to, to happen. Um, but again, this, this process is still maturing, as Ellen was talking about, the notion that we're going to be moving to LMS, et cetera, and behaviors. I think that's the next stage, the next evolution of it. Um, and that, that piece is really going to be necessary, and I'm actually going to talk about that in a slide. So, um, so all about going from analysis to impact and back again, because that's what continuous improvement is all about. We were talking about KPIs. The good thing about the KPIs is that it allows an apples to and it allows an apples to apples comparison. And when I present data as much as possible, I try to present benchmark data as well as trend data. The benchmark lets you know if you're doing, um, doing well or doing poorly compared to your peers, trending better or worse. So if you just do it a two by two matrix, you can see that if you're doing worse than you were last year and worse than your peers, that's the worst case scenario. In, in order for you to get to the best case scenario, you're going to have to do better and or all your peers are going to have to just fail. That We're, we're not going to count on that. We're just going to count on us doing better. So that's, that's our path that we want to take. We want to do better and eventually we want to you know, continually do better for all students. The, one of the shortcomings of uh, KPIs is that typically they're at a pretty high level. Um, and that holds some consequences for, for us. And that's really why we uh, reached out to the PAR group and joined PAR. Uh, because they're at a high level, uh, it doesn't tell us how to really leverage those numbers. How, how do we make an impact? 
And when we're talking about intentionally using data, uh, reports typically that I produce are at one of three levels. They're at the, either the strategic, tactical, or operational level. Most of the KPIs are at that strategic level, very high level. Um, what isn't provided is, is what are the levers? What can we move in order to have an impact on that student's success? And that's uh, where PAR comes in in its uh, basically starting to disaggregate the data, digging into it a little bit better. Um, and then finally, the lowest level is the operational level. And that's where really where uh, your, your folks on the ground are doing work with the data. So that would be, for example, your advisors having information. Um, that might be your uh, recruiters in uh, the student success or, or student services in outreach, um, you know, trying to get more students in the door, uh, a higher yield in certain zip codes, et cetera, or different markets. So we've got these three different levels. And uh, what's really necessary for us to, in order to make a change is to have things at that uh, tactical level. What are, the, what are the levers that we can move? At the end of the day, a lot of what we're trying to do is, and it's a lofty goal, and that is to try to help students change their learning behaviors or their, their studying behaviors. Uh, in order to do that, we typically go through a progression of understanding of the information, the data, et cetera. So we'll go from observing a behavior to being able to predict it. And that's, again, that fits exactly what, what PAR is all about. Um, we can observe a behavior, studying behaviors, how many times they go to the tutoring center, et cetera. We can predict it. The next step was really about the uh, understanding it. And that's where the marriage of the data and the reports with the subject matter experts is critical. Um, because once we understand it, then we can start talking about controlling it. And, may, and perhaps controlling is a misnomer, but rather influencing it. Uh, I think that knowledge isn't enough. Uh, if knowledge was enough, then we probably wouldn't have a lot of, we'd have a lot less smokers, a lot less speeders, and a lot more students in the tutoring center. So it's, it's you know, them knowing it isn't enough. We need more insight as to what are the other things uh, that can really help students, you know, get to the tutoring center, uh, understand time management, et cetera. So we typically, like I said, we typically go through that progression of observing, predicting, then understanding the behavior where it's insightful, and then influencing it. Now, our use of the PAR data, uh, we have just begun, to, we're still kind of verifying the data, and then we're going to slowly roll out the information to your question. Um, we have not taken really a look at the individual student level as of yet. We're still looking at the aggregates and disaggregating the data. So for example, what we have here, this is a typical dashboard for students retained into the second year, and there is an average risk score of 43, so about 43% of the students are not, not making it to the second year. Um, now what we can do is we can uh, really invite uh, decision makers and subject matter experts to start moving around different, different factors. Uh, Ellen was talking about moving the, the GPA slide. And again, this is a static image, so I'm not going to be really you know, uh, demonstrate it too well, but move the GPA. So if the, what's the student's prior GPA? How might that impact, uh, or not the specific student, but the group of students, how might that impact the risk factors? Um, what are the uh, potential needs? Um, what I did do is I did put in there for the next slide, I put in there, what if the student was a veteran? So down here, I... Down here I clicked on yes, and we see now if a student was a veteran, they are more likely to be retained. So only 29% uh, of the students were not retained to the next year. Well, that's very important to know, and you know, when we start talking about what are the positive things, the positive behaviors that we want to reinforce for students, you know, perhaps we can dig deeper into those and find out, well, what is it about veterans? Are they more focused? Are they uh, more motivated? Are they older? Th these type of things. Well, some of those things are leverageable for all students. You know, that motivation. Maybe it's a matter of, well, did you know that if, uh, you know, you got a degree, you would be able to earn such and such more, more money, et cetera. Um, 
it's really, it's that connection of the use of the data with subject matter experts and digging into it and um, the next level would, would be getting into the LMS piece, identifying those specific behaviors, uh, other instruments that could be used, you know, focus groups with these, with these students. Uh, what's going on? Uh, what are their knowledge, skills, attitudes, uh, abilities? What are they bringing to the fore to help uh, with, with that uh, question? You mentioned LMS data. It occurs to me there are several other kinds of, of student data that most ins institutions have uh, that it didn't appear to me maybe was in, was in the database. And I'm just curious whether you s see some potential um, predictive value of students' residence situation, students' participation in co-curricular activities, and then the big one to me is financial. Uh, the only real financial <laughs> data set you have is, is Pell, uh, eligibility, or receipt. Uh, but not student debt, not timely payment, not other things which might indicate financial stress uh, and could be a significant uh, predictor of success. So I, d I don't know if Ellen, Ellen may also have a comment on whether there's an expansion of this database as you perfect the predictive analytic model, obviously you can make it even more minutely targeted and predictive if you can add to the base data. Yeah, I'm sure we're gonna be getting more granular with, uh, with the data. However, too, though, uh, there's that balance of um, having information that might be available to other, other institutions. So it's that balance um, that we're, we're trying to do as well. Um, maybe well, we, we do that. intend to extend the financial aid question. We know that this is a very rich arena, and uh, I think to Chris's point, mindful that it, not everybody collects some of the information. So as we have been moving ahead right now, I can assure you that the, the financial aid parts of this are absolutely on the roadmap. The degree to which we are able to dive in to uh, the ways individual institutions collect information is also something that now that we have been able to get through the first round of the predictive model construction and are, are pretty comfortable with, with the model's reliability, we will continue to build that out as well. But because that part of our heavy lifting is pretty well on track at the moment, now we are having a chance to start looking into more specific types of ways in which individual institutional partners want to dive into their own data. And from there, we can go back and almost pull out a, put out a call for participation from within the PAR membership. I mean, I will tell you that one of the nice things about working with, in a nonprofit setting with members who are committed toward a common goal is that it opens up conversations for subgroups to be doing some of the collaborations that are going on right now. And you know, frankly, getting back to my to my Hoover Dam example much earlier, if we on the PAR team have done our job right and we have provided water for all of our, you know, the metaphorical water for all the institutions that wants to be able to grow wonderful things, what they grow is really up to them and the way that they can get at the three sets we built is, again, it's a resource for them to use, not for us to constrain their creativity or their ingenuity or their innovation. And building off of that notion of greater granularity, to your question about uh, the intent of the students, I think what we need, will be de needing to do as well is filtering out those students who are there only for one year. Uh, so in this metric, we've got retained into the second year. And oftentimes what happens is um, policy more people take a look at it and say, well, they didn't go their full two years. Their program only lasted a year, that they fulfilled their goal and that was it. So filtering on that uh, piece, um, and perhaps the uh, easiest one would to move that, move in that direction would be based on program, program length. Program length is one year, then that, that might be uh, you know, the easiest way to progress with regard to intention. Uh, just another ex example of min uh, changing the numbers a little bit. So we, I also took a look at uh, traditional age students. So these are non-traditional age students, and we see that 52%, so non-traditional, 
So no, they're not traditional age. 52% uh, are not making it to that second year. And even this, though, I, I'm thinking we have to dig deeper into the data. Why is that? Perhaps their programs are more, uh, to a certain, are more one-year programs. Um, just having this information isn't the, the total answer. We have to dig even deeper into it. So, But what's really good about the PAR piece and this piece is it gets the conversation started and it gets those subject matter experts working with the data. Uh, my chancellor uh, came to me once and he said, what's the greatest thing about dashboards? And he pointed out beyond the fact that it's just not only informational, but it's engaging. And now with this, something like this, we can engage the subject matter experts, the decision makers in the use of the data. And that, that, that piece is key and that's really where you know, the PAR uh, whole system works. Uh, I want to race ahead here to the notion that what we're, what's really needed is an infrastructure. Um, I talked about the intentional use of the data. It works best if, if it's built into an infrastructure of accountability. So everybody has the same metrics. Um, they can then use those data. You create uh, discussions about the data. You vet it out properly. You roll it out so that people are engaged in it. But again, a report didn't solve any problem. What you need is that action. So if you build it into an infrastructure of accountability in which it's expected every year that a unit is to do something to you know, improve it either itself or its services or, or something uh, for the benefit of the student and have to report back to the larger, uh, larger constituency that they've done something, that, that's really key. And, I mean, our accrediting bodies are really pushing for that as well with the, the institutional effectiveness and SACS, um, cycle of continuous improvement, et cetera. So data by itself, great. Data with insight, fantastic. Data with insight and then action uh, built into an infrastructure of accountability, that's, that's really what it's all about for us anyway. Um, so this is just a quick look of, at our cycle. So we go from planning in June and August. So the planning st stages are all due by September 1 to implementing, typically during the academic year, August through May. Progress report is due February 1st. And then we move to evaluating, uh, testing the effectiveness of the intervention. Did it work or not? How well did it work? And that's all due by August 1st. And going back to that notion of a KPI providing a common metric allows for collaboration. Well, that's allowing us for collaboration even within our own institution. We're six colleges and you'd be surprised or maybe not surprised to hear that sometimes it's difficult to communicate across six colleges what everybody's doing. So we built this system such that we've got a common metric. We can do an apples to apples comparison. And then we've got a common documentation system saying this is what you did. Uh, we have a IE summit. We sit down and we talk. Um, the functional folks can sit down. And the, all the tutoring directors can sit down. This is what I did. This is what worked. What did you do? Um, so at the micro level, KPIs support that as well. But we're also collaborating across colleges with PAR, um, with Texas Completes. I was just at Gulf Coast Association for Institutional Research, a meeting yesterday. Uh, that's you know, 10 colleges sitting sitting down talking about how they're using the data, et cetera. So I think uh, I've only been in uh, you know the IR area about four years, but in, in the, I can see in just a short amount of time that more and, there's more and more collaboration, I believe, and the use of KPIs, et cetera, really facilitates that. But you're right, too. It should be done intentionally. We should be taking a look at um, building it towards uh, also including the students' intentions, et cetera. And I think uh, there's also some, you know, we should pr also sometimes proceed with caution as well, so. Can, can I ask, um, can you demystify some of these acronyms for me, like KPI? Oh my goodness, I'm sorry. Uh, key performance indicator. Okay, and how about uh, LMS? Learning Management System. Uh, SIS. 
I think that was something I wrote down. Student information system. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, and the IRB is Institutional Research. Review. Institutional Review Board. Review Board. Okay. Um, and, and I am one curious about, uh, uh, and I'm, I'm, you know, like Jerry, I, I really think this big data stuff is a great idea, and and I think we'll learn a lot from it and and take a lot from it. But but I'm I'm curious. I think that, and and this is again, this is a layperson asking a probably dumb questions to you guys. Um, was it the was it the uh, or were were community colleges equally incentivized as four in year institutions? to really make sure that their students were actually, you know, not just dropping out and, and that were, you know, that they wouldn't be, that they were incentivized to make sure that their students were doing better. Are you doing this just because it's, and it is really good for your students? I mean, I, I was wondering what, what came first, the chicken or the egg? The chicken and, I will and then the egg and then the chicken <laughs> and then... <laughs> Uh, I, I, uh, for uh, and I'm sure it's the case for uh, all institutions. We were all striving to do better for the students. I, you know, you ask any faculty member; they're all about students learning, etc. I think what has happened is uh, we're, we've become more mature in doing that, um, more accurate, more efficient, and we have had. Uh, some helping guidance with you know, accrediting bodies and SACs pushing forward with IE, uh, and it it has been helpful. I, I you know I won't uh, I I I think you know SACs coming through and, and it really giving us that account helping us with that accountability piece has helped us. But the goal of all, in, in, you know, instructors, all educators, et cetera, has always been to um, help students. So, uh, and with regard to the success points, yes, that 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 helps us as well. That you know, um, because what what's really key, I think, that to understand about the data, if it's done properly, is is that the metric should be tied to your values and your mission. So when we're looking at the data, it should really be representing what we're looking to do to help the students. So I, I think maybe- I couldn't agree more, Chris. Yeah, yeah. I just want to jump in and, and reiterate that. I mean, really for us as institutions doing this work, um, we've been pretty focused on keeping this in the public sector and not running it as a company, even while many, many analytics companies are starting to jump up and, and, and we'll be able to step in to do some of this work. What we have found, though, is that because we live outside of that commercial arena and because we are uh, coming at this as, as a higher education public policy organization, our ability to help further the discussion from the perspective of what educators expect their vendors to provide has been a really important part of our ability to keep focused on the students and to make sure that what we are providing for students helps us be successful as institutions. But Chris nailed it. I mean, the fact that every one of the institutions that we are working with and are going to be working with has uh, a mission for how they intend to work with their students and making sure that we help them align missions with, with, with their practical applications has been, it has been so important at this time that we're, that we're anticipating this, this additional sort of acceleration of, of fascination with the technologies that allow us to do this, that making sure that we make sure that the education voice and the student voice is strong has is, is really been probably our, our biggest driving variable, the, the biggest driving factor for this entire project. I, I have one um, kind of student-oriented question. Chris mentioned something about that, you know, the, the better students probably know when they're in trouble and they go ask for help, uh, some of them, most of them, if they're good students. Uh, guys like me, when I was in college, if I got in trouble, I was afraid to talk to anybody. Uh, and I'm just wondering that if you've had interventions, how do the students react? 
if somebody comes to them rather than the other way around to say, looks like you need some help and we're ready to give it to you. Do they react positively or do they say, well, uh, you know, I don't need that. I, I'll, I'll be okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, what we're learning is sometimes uh, it's the vehicle to communicate that to the students. Oddly enough, students listen to other students a lot. Um, and sometimes that message is best delivered via a peer. Um, when we're standing up there, maybe they, I, I can't really get into their heads, but uh, maybe they, they just feel we're pontificating. However, if a student says, hey, listen, this is what you should be doing, we may have uh, you know, a larger impact. So again, it's not just the knowledge piece, it's you know, what, what all, there's multi, multiple factors involved as well, so. Uh, that's a very astute question because one of the biggest problems in community colleges is, is Hispanic males and black males that are not uh, succeeding at the same level as, as the females are. And a lot of it has to do is they don't ask for help. Uh, and they are they do come with uh, more risk factors in some cases. So having data like this that's predictive uh, and, and then having processes in place, like, for example, we have great alerts and we have advising that's really been amped up in that area does help retain those students. So um, going back to the point of uh, why are we in this particular model, and which I think it's, it's a wonderful model, it's got every component that I know of in terms of student success, is that Beth Community Colleges have been on, in, a, in an agenda for like five years now. And it's all started with the Lumina Foundation and Achieving the Dream in terms of looking at students instead of the culture that you normally expect at an a institution of higher learning. And that is, focus on the students, focus on the students and, and their success. And so uh, we're way ahead of the game in terms of community colleges having some of this in place. But what I like about this particular uh, process is that the commonality piece, being able to uh, compare apples to apples. And, and we have not had that before. And I think the work of this committee would be well served to look at something like this to get some kind of commonality that we can develop a statewide dashboard. Not, and David's little raising his fingers, he probably says he's already got it. And we do have something here that I saw at the last meeting that I thought was very important, and that's the, that, the GIS system that you have here at the coordinating board. It has a, it has a, a tremendous potential for, for uh, being used as a dashboard to uh, uh, simulate some of this data. So again, uh, as a trustee at, at the community college level, uh, we get uh, bombarded with a lot of data, and a lot of it is negative because of, there's no lack, uh, commonality, and it's not drilled down to uh, the, the students as, as, and the, the program impact on the students. So I think this, this has a lot of potential. Uh, might I, I add something? I, I, this could clearly be done um, sure. if people want to do it. We have an individual student record for every student in the state, public, private. We don't have as much data for the private institutions, but we also have data for the for profits. But in terms of public institutions, we have almost all of this data. What we are lacking is um, individual in, uh, interventions by student. We don't have that, but it would be easy working with our database to add that in because we do have data for 50 community college districts for all the students. We have for 38 public universities. If they leave the system and go somewhere else, we at least know that they succeeded elsewhere. We also have workforce data that can be added in. What I think is really important about what we've heard today is something that we've seen is, is that those people actually instructing the students aren't getting the access to the data. And, and we've talked about that in turn. That's the important part, and I have to say, uh, even with Achieving the Dream Schools, we did an evaluation of developmental ed, and. And our evaluators, not knowing who was, was what, said that every school, the people actually instructing the students didn't really have access to data or know about the data. And I, and I asked, well, are there any achieving the dream schools? There were three. So even at, at those three, now it may be different at all the other schools, but that data was being reviewed clearly at a high level because I knew it was, but it wasn't reaching the instructors in a meaningful way. And I think that's clearly important here because they don't necessarily know. Say you're in developmental ed, they don't necessarily know what happened to them when they leave their class. They don't know whether they go forward or not. And that's a piece mm -hmm. 
that if the institutions were wanting to, we could really enable that. We wouldn't have to build a new data system. We could add data in a, in a similar way that we do with our pathways in some of the states we're, you know, we're doing in San Antonio. And you guys in San Antonio, we've got link, we have linked the uh, uh, high school, community college, university data. We've added in local data that we partition from our data. We don't use it, but it's available to run. We do some of this in Houston, El Paso, the Valley. So there's that potential, and so I think we could learn from what this project is doing and, and with Lone Star in the state, and I know they, they do very good things. Uh, we, we can make this more possible at a relatively low cost, and it could be done in some unique ways by individual institutions as well, but that, I, th I think it's really important. But we, we, we do have a record on it, every student, and, and I know for this purpose you only need it for, for three years, but we have it going back. 30 years. Well, and again, we do have high school data David, for uh, students again, as well. Again, one of the, our, our roles here is to to look forward to 2030. I think it's the date that we're, we're looking at. And if we move forward, we need to look at that commonality and, and uh, using that process to, to uh, look at what we're doing. Um, again, one of my biggest frustrations uh, being a trustee on a board has been not having data that we can that's utilized. And, and going back to what you were talking about, uh, uh, look at, or you, David, talking about going uh, to a different level, like the instructor level with the information, we're busy trying to put up a dashboard of our own. But I think, I think that should be a component that everybody should have as we move forward with the, this new, new concept. Uh, the, the, the point, though, is it, it has so much uh, importance in terms of uh, looking at the student, for example, it, most of the time we, we ignore the impact that adjuncts have in, in terms of our programming. Uh, we, we, we tend to not include them as much and we don't know what kind of impact they're having. We also uh, are, are in, in a sense, not looking at how well prepared our instructors are. This is a good way to get them to, to focus on something like that because we assume because they get a, a full professorship or something like that, they know how to teach. When, when you look at developmental courses, uh, it, you, you really have to teach at a different, uh, a different level in, in a different way. So for example, in our, in our board, we've allocated a million dollars for professional development because we have to um, ensure that people know how to address some of the risk factors that students bring to, to our, our colleges. And I'm talking about community colleges only. So this data could be very valuable in making some of those decisions. Yeah. Sure, Beth. If I might just add one, one comment. To the, to the point being made of the number of data projects, I mean, what we are seeing now is that there are so many. Yeah. There are going to be more coming. The fact that we are just on the very, very early stages of this recognition that we have information in all these systems that are going to help us make some big decisions. This is really where you have seen so much of our effort focusing on the common definitions. While we are interested in having people participate in our work with PAR, the reality is that we've already started collaborating with the Achieving the Dream Schools because there are things that the common data definitions are going to allow the Achieving the Dream Schools to do, whether they're a part of PAR or not. That's the very same thing that even the Gates Foundation, our funders, have recognized that they have literally hired PAR to come in and support them on other data projects because we've all recognized that we can't, you know, the trains all already left the station and everybody wants to be able to work with their data and we shouldn't stand in the way of that happening. But if we want these data to be relevant and meaningful and generalizable and to help inform us at the public policy level, there has to be a point at which we have the opportunity to crosswalk, to almost think about some of this, I mean, what we've, we, we were actually described by one of our partners as having part functioning as the Rosetta Stone of student success data because he could use it um, within his own institution across several of the platforms he was already using and, in fact, has really started pushing him more toward more effective data warehousing activities. So I, I, I applaud the, the broad efforts. And, I mean, as, as, a, as a data person myself, I mean, it's so exciting that all of a sudden this is not the type of thing being relegated to the back room where only those of us who are data geeks cared about it. If we can help people make better decisions, we shouldn't have to care where the data is coming from. We just have right. to make sure that it's valid, reliable, and generalizable. So I, I, I applaud these efforts to, to broaden our opportunities to work this way. 
Ken. I have a question for Chris. So from an operational standpoint, we have a variety of interventions. And so as we are doing these interventions, our callback programs, our orientation, and the different steps of advising, we put that into our system. And then we can see, OK, these students that are first time in college that went through with this intervention, they were this much more successful than other students. And so we can see how they get through that first semester. And is that kind of how you guys are doing this? So you'll be able to take these cohorts that you put up on the table, and then you can say, well, this group had these interventions, and you specifically define the interventions for your school? Yeah, exactly. So, okay. uh, and the greater clarity with regard to what was done, what action steps, et cetera, uh, what was that uh, active agent that really had the impact on the students? Um, yes, we're documenting all of that in, so that we can actually share it amongst ourselves and then share it um, uh, with PAR members, share it with Texas Complete members, et cetera. Uh, this, it's, it's exciting to see so many people just collaborating because there's a higher uh, purpose in helping students. So uh, I, I'm working with the IR person over at HCC. You know, we call her up, hey, what are you doing? What's working? Um, it's, it's really wonderful. And so from a common definition standpoint, is it common definitions around those specific interventions? Or, or what are the common definitions around just the data sets you're collecting? The, the first set of common data definitions focused on the data themselves. Something as simple as making sure that when we talked about grade point average or when we talked about uh, withdrawals, what did we actually mean by the, the terms that we used to make sure that we were common. So those were the first wave of definitions that were published. The second wave of definitions now are starting to do precisely as you described with the interventions, not so much to categorize them, but to come up with the common explanation of the categories and subcategories that some of these interventions um, represent. And this is work in progress. And frankly, as you can imagine, you know, we're not going to be doing this just qualitatively based on our opinions about this. This is where the idea of actually doing field tests to take a look at, at what these interventions are, what they do, and how they might compare you know, again, our, our, our role here is not to judge which are the best ones as it is. What are the interventions that are available? How are they being used? What are the measures to show their efficacy in which environment? Well, just getting that data from a standpoint of trying to see where you're investing in interventions, I mean, because they cost. And so yeah. which are, what are the results you're getting? And, you know, we've started doing that, how we're tracking in our system. But you've got multiple interventions, and so how do you figure out those relationships? But this sounds really powerful and has a lot of potential. We hope so. Well, as you, as you can imagine, the, the idea that we can start systematizing this has been getting a fair amount of attention, both from within our partners as well as uh, some of the other data projects where we've been working. This is one of those common points of interest. The, you know, how we, de how do we describe our data so we are making apples to apples comparisons, how the interventions are described so we know how they're being used and, and how we, you know, what type of value we get and for whom and under what conditions because, you know, what works at one school isn't necessarily going to work at another and we need to yeah. be okay with talking about effective practices, not just best practices. Effective, given the context, really does make a difference. So it's, uh, I think we're going to be very busy with this for quite some time. It, it has certainly been, um, it, you know, it, it underscores that people are interested in the predictions to the degree that we know what to do about the predictions. And this is one of those places where we've finally been able to be uh, deeply and directly actionable. And it's been, um, as we've heard, heard from some of our partners, it's the first time in years that they actually feel like they can actually get in and make a difference and see something moving. And so it's been... Uh, it's been a great catalyst for, for really moving this type of work ahead. I have one final question, uh, and maybe it's for David. You don't have to come forward. Just You can answer it from right there. Does our data capture what Lee asked about in terms of student debt and, and uh, payment and so forth? It sounded as though he was addressing a broader issue of, you know, to say debt on a car and, and that type of thing. We don't. I don't think anyone does. I, don't, uh, I think we have more financial information uh, in Texas than is provided here. 
Uh, we have a very large financial aid database, so we, we know about a broader range of, of aid beyond Pell, yeah. uh, but we don't know about I, I, the type of debt I believe Lee was talking about, which I think is important. You don't know, and, and we've often said that, that even uh, something as simple as a student's battery dying on their car may prevent them from attending yeah. class or enrolling mm -hmm. because they can't afford $100 for another battery. And, and that's much more significant than we would think. So that if we yep. had a way to get at that, that would be very helpful. And it, it, it's clearly a factor, but I don't think anyone anywhere collects right. that kind of data. Oh, one, one last one Best last got thing. one final. And, and, and Dr. Gardner, Dr. Gardner, David. Still here. <laughs> um, and I'm, I'm I know that we are lucky in the state of Texas having your big, giant, big data that everyone is so keen on these days. But, but do you have a tool like the this PAR, the this which I guess is sort of a collective uh, a methodology for collecting the specific data? And I know why it needs to be the same; it needs to go in the same box and stuff. But do we have something like that at the coordinating board that you could go in and start mining this if you were given? The go ahead, or do you need a tool like like the, the this par thing to go in and okay. start something? There, there, there are a couple things. Number one, we we do have common data definitions, which we've good, had over good. the years, Perfect. and that's an advantage. And we think the advantage of a common data definition is you can know that the data is the same, but you can disagree with about what it means. <laughs> but you don't, you know, you're not arguing about that or measuring how it's calculated. There, there it, we, we actually had a dream, some of us, 12 years ago, that we could have a system where people could come in and do all their own analysis. And because of certain restrictions with FERPA now, uh, that isn't possible. We, we do, we actually have a room here where people can come in and, and sign an agreement and do any type of data analysis pre, pretty much they want. And in fact, that's totally booked up for months. We do have uh, our... Uh, educational research centers, which have all of our data, including the high school data. Um, but I, I think there could be some means where, at least in terms of an individual institution Might doing the analysis, do and, and, and I was thinking earlier, for example, uh, you know, the community colleges have gone into this great effort in terms of uh, some common purchasing. I mean, if, if the community colleges and the universities were to do something similar and to, to contract with a vendor to develop a particular tool so that their institution could go in and use our data and use it for themselves and we could probably pull out some type of data that's masked to, to do something else and then add in their, their local data. I think mm -hmm. that is something that, that would be doable because I, I do think it's there's certain things that it's really appropriate for the individual school to do, not for us to do. And, but we would like for them to not have to build up a new database to do that. Right. And right. so I, I think we would do whatever we could to support that. And, and uh, this may be the genesis for a way to do that. And, yeah. and I think that's important because, for example, the rural colleges don't have the resources that some of the urban colleges have. And uh, there's a lot of work being done in smaller institutions like that. And so it's some, something to help them out so they don't have to reinvent the wheel. I, I th and I think that you're right. You have to do it collectively. You know, we take something called tech share for granted now, our electronic library and resource sharing. When that first came about, there was state purchasing involved, which meant, and it was really that the resources of the University of Texas, University of Houston, Texas A&M, really put a lot of resources into making that possible. But what it meant was that Sol Rawls, or Alvin Community College had access to journals that they previously couldn't afford. Uh -huh. And even the, you know, the University of Texas saved money. So doing some things statewide in terms of uh, joint development can, can reduce costs a great deal for individual institutions. And I think we have some institutions that could help, help others as we did with TechShare to make that happen. Right. And also empowering the individual institution to look at their own data will be very helpful as well because we are uh, in an environment of limited resources. So in this way, they, they can really take a look at what needs to be targeted first. They can prioritize for themselves uh, and then just become more efficient with the use of their own uh, funds. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Thank you for your time. Uh, Appreciate it. Dr. Wagner, Ellen, and uh, 
And Chris, uh, thanks very much. Uh, this is very uh, informative. And being an old NASA guy, like I say, I love the data and the information and trying to analyze it and see what it means. I also uh, sympathize with Beth on the use of acronyms. Uh, we, we invented them almost at NASA. Nobody could understand what we were trying to say. But uh, thanks Paul for thought it was two well-done presentations. Really appreciate it from both of you. Well, thank you very much. I've really appreciated the opportunity to join you today. And um, congratulations on the work that you're doing. Best wishes. And um, I will be looking forward to having various uh, points of connection with you all as as we find ourselves uh, supporting our, our ongoing partners. So um, congratulations, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I, I'm going to call a break since I'm the temporary runner of this Hi. thing. I, okay, um, we're ready to talk about the transition to moving beyond closing the gaps, and we've got uh, Deputy Commissioner David Gardner and Assistant Commissioner Susan Brown, who's going to... Uh, talk to us about that. So um, have at it. Okay. Uh, thank you. And uh, I don't think what I have to say will take very long, uh, but I'd appreciate any comments. We, we felt it was important to talk about, to pro provide you some background as to how we developed the last plan. It's been many years. I think two or three of you are familiar with that, but, but we're hoping our board will uh, undertake a similar process because it, we think they show great wisdom in, in how to approach development of a plan and, and how to work with institutions on that. And I think uh, one thing I've, I've talked with Fred Heldenfels about is we have even greater opportunity with some technologies involved, even broader, broaden input uh, and feedback to the, the plan uh, beyond what we did before. But I think there were a couple things before we developed a plan the board did that I think were important. The first is they provided us with basic principles in terms of developing a plan. You know, a state plan is different from an institutional plan. It's not an operational plan. And the first was, what are the most important goals for the state? In other words, they didn't want to have every possible goal that you could have. You know, what was most important to the, the state at that time? And if you looked at plans in other states, uh, some of them had 20, 25 goals, and, and it was really hard to tell what they were about. Uh, institutions can do that for themselves, and it's very good. Uh, they wanted to look at the state goals as results. I mean, could you really measure them? Was there a really outcome related to it? Uh, then they said, well, let's include some promising state strategies. They understood that there shouldn't be many. There should be just a few because they really wanted to have a, an opportunity for individual institutions to recognize their differences and what strategies were most important to them. Uh, they wanted to have make sure we had a system so we could ensure our progress, so we could really know if we were making uh, a difference in, in progress. And, and the board, you know, really at every quarterly meeting once the, the, this plan was developed, reviewed progress on, on one of the major goals and even made some changes as we saw progress going on. And something easy to remember, I, it, you know, it was really helpful when you could go to the legislature and people could e really say what the four goals were. And, and that was helpful in terms of getting institutional buy-in. Um, you know, furthering on this, they said, what characteristics would the plan have itself? They need to be concise and focused. Again, you need to be able to see exactly what was it, to not have more than two to five goals, what you've developed when the concept of the wave at this point fits in with that. Measurable tar targets, some broad strategies. Um, there's some that people don't even remember were in the first plan, such as uh, the institution's ability to, university's ability to maintain their overhead income. At the, the time this plan was developed, they were not able to keep all their overhead income. In, uh, health science centers were got that through the legislature. The adoption of the recommended high school program is a standard uh, for graduating from high school and eventually at, at universities. So there were a number of key elements like that. It, 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 Texas grant was just coming into being at this time. How do you make it affordable? So there were a few key strategies, but not, not a lot. Even, even if you, you look in, under research you'd see there's, there's a notion of what became emerging research universities that we needed to develop uh, some institutions in, in, in at least in key metropolitan areas in the state. So there are a number of things embedded in that. And the nice thing about a, a good plan is some things happen and people sometimes forget that it came from the plan, but, but it sets the seeds for things to go forward. But, and finally, you know, it stimulates creativity and adaptability. So 
there are some things that, that I always like to bring up that happen. So we don't really, when you look at success, we don't use graduation rates. We talk about, about uh, graduates. And one reason for that is we knew that one thing you could do is get students who had left school back into school. That was an important strategy. But, but without having that as a specific goal in the plan, if you look at our institutions statewide, graduation rates have gone up significant amount. They're not where they should, but they've gone up a lot. Why? Well, we can't name all the reasons because there's some things institutions have done. We don't know what they did, but they've clearly improved. And that's important. So, so it gave the room for that local creativity in an important kind of way. And, you know, when we first started this on the university side, the statewide graduation rate was 45 percent, and there were two institutions above that, and everybody else was below. Now, the majority of our institutions are above the 45. So that they, they did this. And so it wasn't because this plan told them what to do. And, and at least at the staff level, we're hoping we'd, the type of plan we developed will be similar to that. Next. Um, this is a little premature in the order here, but, but we made sure that we shared this with everyone. We, we distributed around 1,500 copies of the draft went to the governor, the legislature, the, all the institutions, of course, chambers of commerce, uh, regents and trustees, other state agencies, associations, others. We sent this to the faculty associations, the faculty senates at each campus. We had over 100 comments received, but there are things that you couldn't document when we were out and people would talk to us a lot. And we, you know, the, the first draft of the plan looks very similar to the final draft, but there were some key changes, nuances made that the plan is much better for all those comments. Now, you know, how did we compose this committee? Well, we can't do this again, but we had uh, some, a couple members of the coordinating board actually on there, but, but they were the only ones that were currently serving in some role. Every, we made the uh, decision that we didn't want anyone currently working at an institution on the committee the main committee, because they have to represent their institution. You just can't get away from that in doing it. But it was important that they had significant admin, uh, administrative experience at our school. So we, we had uh, former administrators from across the state, including uh, uh, independent schools, um, who had, I mean, notable names. I don't recall them all at the time. But they, they, they were extraordinary. They were very good. We had a member of the Chamber of Commerce. We had industries represented from banking, computer, petroleum, textile space, utilities. We had a medical foundation represented someone with a legal firm. But the main core of the committee were people who had a great knowledge of the economy. They had a great knowledge of higher education, how it functions, some of the realities, what happens when you're on a campus. But they, they didn't feel that they had to represent uh, this school versus that school, and, and that was very helpful, but they clearly were mindful of that. If you could go back and listen to the discussions, you, you would know that they knew how an institution operated. Uh, now, having said that, you'll look on the left, we had a few task forces. We had participation in success, health professions, and the technology workforce. These were com included members who were actually employed at institutions <laughs> at the time. So, we had some groups, some key groups, uh, given that where the, the committee thought they were going, that they, they clearly needed in, uh, participation from people at institutions, and they were very helpful. Uh, they didn't all do their work the same way. The technology workforce group actually went all around the state interviewing people and having hearings to see what industry felt we, we needed to do. But fundamentally, this group met for about a year and made their recommendations to the coordinating board, and, and, and it went forward. Uh, we worked with groups like Sapupsi and, and other groups. Um, this process cannot work unless you have a lot of input. I mean, the plan is useless unless there's general buy-in. There, there were things that some people wanted that weren't there. We didn't have an emphasis on, on doctoral programs. We knew uh, that every school, if schools all wanted doctoral programs, you didn't have to do anything to do that. But, we, but you had to place some emphasis on undergraduate education, which we did. That, you know, that, the, so the, the process, I think, was very good, and, and it was really developed by the board. It wasn't developed by staff. So going forward in terms, terms of our next plan, 
we just have, you know, we don't have to talk about these again. We're just showing the principles and characteristics again. We, we hope that the board will consider certain aspects like this as directions. Uh, you know, you may have some thoughts on this when you, you meet together uh, a after the presentation in terms of whether you think this is a good idea or whether you think some of the characteristics should be changed. So having said that, let's talk a little bit about the broad outline for the schedule for closing the gaps. Now, number one, we don't have this on here, but you guys have developed the wave. You've done a lot of work, and and at least from a staff standpoint, we see that as a, a, the, the beginning document for a planning committee when it starts. Here, here, here's a starting point. But we've also built in at our uh, next region's governing board conference, the whole afternoon is is work groups in which the those regions, trustees, and, and administrators attending will be sitting there identifying what they think are key issues and and potential goals for the state which will then be brought together and shared as we go forward in the process again when we have a planning committee they will get that but our board will be meeting in December at a retreat to, and at that time they, they you know they can't make decisions but they'll be discussing approaches the next plan will share with them once again the way we, we did that at one board meeting and provide them with feedback we got from the governing board conference you know what are we hearing from everyone in the field and then in January we're, we think the, the board should consider deciding on a planning approach and then start really pretty much immediately in terms of bringing together a group having them discuss and begin that with here's the way here's why it may be that they might want a, you know, a member or two or three from this committee to, to discuss your thoughts in terms of the wave, but to also share that uh, what the regents and trustees thought at their meeting. And then on top of that, you, you've talked about a lot of, of comparisons. So in the past, we did a lot of comparisons with other states. We, we think we would do that again in terms of how we're doing on various things, but also add the international aspect that you've emphasized so much. And so however this ends up, Susan and her staff already know they have to begin developing all this data for people to sort of wave, you know, uh, wade through in, in some ways in terms of what's there that's important that, that we all may have missed before. Uh, between October uh, uh, and then after that, uh, actually, you know, from October tw 2014 to 2015 would be s soliciting, we think, uh, feedback on an early draft and subsequent revisions, but somewhere in between February and October for in the, that first draft, we would obviously need to be asking for input from, from various people, and I think that's for, to some extent, for the, the board to, to say what they'd like to do, but also the committee, you know, when the committee actually convenes, if in fact we have one, what, how would they like to solicit input? Would they like to do it from the state? Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I don't know if you, you were here, Mr. Hellenfels, but you know, we, we had a conversation where we were talking about the ability of, of new technology to get input in, in greater ways than we have in the, in the past. But, and then finally, uh, we think July 2015, hopefully we could uh, take a, a long-range plan uh, for Texas Higher Education to the board that would have been highly vetted and people could agree with. And then, of course, there's a lot one would sort out in between. Um, you know about the draft, uh, your draft, so I won't go into that, but this is a key starting point. You've done a lot of work um, uh, in getting here. I, I know that institutions have some interest in, in what exactly do the, the value and in, in, in the excellence mean here, and, and that, that's to be expected. But, I, but it's important to point out that, and some of you know, that uh, the legislature passed House Bill 2036, which creates uh, 2036 commi commission to identify future higher education workforce needs in Texas and, and make various related recommendations. Now, I don't know how that will, none of us knows how that will work. When the legislature has done that in the past, it's been more sort of project oriented in a way rather than a plan. So I, I don't know, it could be more like a plan, but for example, the uh, program we had for many years, advanced research, advanced uh, technology programs, which at one time was $60 million a biennium, came out of the Select Committee on Higher Education in 1987, which was structured similarly to this. So there were a number of things like that that came out of that plan. We'll, we'll have to see, but 
in the legislation, they, they list some areas that that, that uh, committee should, should look at. So, I just, so we just produce a side-by-side -side so that you could see that there's some things you've produced in WAVE that are very slim, similar to the A to F that is talked about. So we would suggest that as we go forward with the planning committee that, that also another piece they look at are these, this A to F, which is, um, are things that the 2036 commission would want to look at so that the planning committee could at the very least develop some base information for that group to go forward to. So I think you can see they're both, and, and I have to think they looked at your wave at some point because it was shared with the legislature, but you know, they both are talking about 60% of, of the workforce holding a post-secondary <laughs> education credential. In your efforts, you didn't talk anything about the number of institutions being designated as research institutions, so that's a little separation. Both uh, talk in, in one way or another about the alignment to the workforce. Uh, they, they did talk about increasing the, those who are college attending, and, and again, it's just measured in a slightly different kind of way, and I, I think going forward, we probably want to look at that in various formations for the committee. Uh, Increased percentage of degrees and certificates earned within 100% of the time. I, I'd say, you know, we, this doesn't really, it looks like this aligns with improved affordability of higher education. It's related, but I, I, I think we probably should have had that line down further. Um, and then assuring students demonstrate competence in their field. They're talking about global competitiveness. Again, they're not exactly the same thing, but there is a theme in terms of, of the students being better prepared, having a better prepared workforce, uh, some global competitiveness, which doesn't show up directly in your way, but we know you talked a lot about, and we, we think that's something that will probably come out in this plan. And then, so I, I told you I'd go through very quickly. Uh, we can talk about anything you'd like to talk about, ask questions, or if you prefer, you could just take this and just go forward directly to your group discussion, whatever your pleasure. Questions? Um, one, I was on the coordinating board when we did 2015, if you remember, closing the gaps. And I think that the strength of it proved to be that you got institutional buy-in. And I know you, I remember the staff working, and Pam working really hard on getting out to the institutions and make sure they weren't going to get this bullet from above with no input. And, um, and it sounds like we've got, you've got a similar thing in mind that you would get their buy-in early and, and ask for their input. Um, I think that's critical to, to doing this. The thing about the 2036 that, uh, commission that kind of makes me wonder, should we align our goal with 2036? Um, or something. That's, uh, and that's just a yeah. question. I mean, why have why have two the state going in one direction and the coordinating board kind of going to an earlier deadline? And maybe that's okay, but it just seems like yeah, it ought to be answered. Um, I don't know who's the chair, but <laughs> the jury. <laughs> uh, Listen, I'm not going to tell him He's that you king. guys He's said I'm better than he is at this. So. <laughs> and I'm not going to say I'm deferring to someone who graduated in my father's class. So. <laughs> <laughs> that is very true. In fact, we were good friends. We used to be. Well, his son came along. <laughs> well, uh, I, I agree it should align with, with whatever the state does, but I think that you can't wait till, you know, 36 for, for us to, to see if this is going to work or not. So I do think there should be some type of, uh, it, it, if you're going to tie it to 2036, there should be a um, five-year, ten-year, you know, wake-up call here. The thing that was, that's different about what you, you have with the goals is it's not very specific. So I don't know how you, you, um, I mean, I think that the beauty of the the other one was you had a couple of really specific things. I mean, like that, uh, the over, I totally forgot about that. And I also forgot how long ago it was. I mean, I thought it was five years ago. Gosh, time goes by when you're having fun. Um, 
committee. <laughs> no, I was on that committee. Um, but, but so I think that it would probably behoove the state of Texas, the coordinating board or whoever, to really, to really come up with some things that you can measure and not this ethereal sort of stuff that is really, um, you know, I mean, yes, three institutions that are research institutions. God, dog, that's the lowest. I mean, that, that that's such a low number. By, by 2036, surely we can do better than that. Um, and, and are these stretch goals? Or are these are these goals that I mean, you know, maybe the 60 percent holding a, a, a college degree is a stretch goal, but but I'm not sure if some of these others are or are, are how you measure them. Well, I, I think that the point about the stretch goals is really important. And as you say that, I realize it wasn't listed in the principles, but I can say the committee and the board talked a great deal about the fact they needed to be really challenging goals. They needed to be the right goals, but uh, they shouldn't be picking something that would just be easy to do. If it was easy to do, it wasn't really that important to the state. Uh, and so I, I think that's, we really need to, mm -hmm. at least in my right. view, emphasize mm -hmm. that. Uh, I would, one thing I want to just echo is I agree with Beth that we need to remember that many other states uh, have set that 60% benchmark goal, which is kind of our umbrella goal, if you will. Uh, for the year 2025, like Indiana, or even 2020 in some cases. So uh, I, I don't think we can afford to wait yeah, longer yeah. than 2030. That's sort of, you know, traditionally the southern states, as we've learned, have, have lagged the, the uh, east coast and west coast states by 10 years. <clears throat> so we, we certainly don't want to be uh, any slower. That Having said that, doesn't mean we can't align with 2036. I mean, uh, Chairman Branch is, uh, uh, you know, always very focused on what he calls the optics. And 2036 is obviously our state's 200-year anniversary, and that's precisely why he targeted that year. So my suggestion would be, uh, or thought would be, that, that we find, uh, uh, that we set our, keep our target year at 2030, uh, but that we also come up with a, a uh, constructive way to use those ensuing six years um, you know, whether that's to improve beyond our goals or whether that's to, uh, uh, you know, take a look at uh, um, doing things internationally. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure what that would look like, but I think there's a way to align and, and use the six years constructively without pushing out our, our goal deadline. Yeah, I, I think that's a good recommendation. You know, from someone who's done a lot of plans and planning, you know, 15 year plan is. In terms of having something that you're really focusing on is, I think, about as far as you can really stretch it. Uh, you still need those five and ten year and you still uh, need reset five and reality check exactly. Years. And that's another thing that you know, in terms of the principles that that were there that uh, the board insisted on and but aren't laid out. We probably ought to lay that out. Some of you may not know that uh, you know the original goal for increased. Participation was 500,000, and when the board saw certain new demographic projections, they realized that 500,000 wouldn't get the state to where it should be, and so they increased that to 630,000. Now, some boards would have very, said, "Well, gee, we're we're going to be successful," and but, but they knew that it wouldn't be good for the state, so they raised that goal, and uh, and it is a challenging one, and and in fact, they they did find in terms of uh, the success goal that really the way it was originally configured meant if you achieved your participation, you would probably you know, get more graduates, but you wouldn't really be doing a better job at graduating students. And so they modified the way that goal was uh, measured so that you would truly have an improvement in success. And so I think that's, you know, that board was very wise and, and really made an active plan. And, that was uh, enabled by the committee that really thought about a lot of these things. And, and uh, as I said, you know, that, that first draft uh, at some level would look similar to the final draft, but the, uh, some of those nuances made a real difference in terms of the quality of the final plan. And, and really incentivizing universities, I can tell you knowing the U of H crew and stuff, they were very incentivized, particularly when Renew Couture got there, 
to really use those metrics and use the accountability and collect the the the, the measuring the, the numbers and stuff and really drive it and and try to figure out why it was that you know you know, the graduation rate wasn't so good and really to make changes to to address that and as you say in each different region there might be different reasons why uh, and, and different solutions for, for that. So you're right. I mean, you know, one size does not fit all there. But, but, but having thresholds for, for institutions and, and making them align better with, with um, what they're doing probably does work. I mean, I was one of the ones, if you remember, when we were talking about, and we never did do it, but... Um, Okay, the you know you how you pay for how an institution is paid on upon com completion of courses rather than um, you know on on uh, signing up from that really that makes a whole institution think totally differently about how they have people registering, and again I'm I am I'll say it again I'm the layperson on the board the. Uh, who knows none of these acronyms, and uh, I'm not planning to learn them. But uh, <laughs> uh, but I do know that if you if you put the money, you know where where you're expecting the outcomes, it's amazing how people you know line up to to make sure that they are going to be paid. Yeah, you know, the, the, if you look at the community colleges and their work. Uh, with the success points, you can see how it's changing the way the schools are thinking about a number of things. And and uh, as one president once said, if it's if the data is connected to to money, they at least he pays pays attention. Mm -hmm. And uh, but the, but you have to have those as the right points. And I think right. everyone agreed those were the right points. And you know they're they're again this was a case where there are nuances. I mean they're very similar to what where it was originally proposed, but the the, the changes when the schools worked on that, those nuances, I think, makes it a better system. And, you know, the and, and having students be so saddled with debt, I mean, there is no one. I mean, I'm sure everybody around this table and in this whole room, it's, it's terrible if you're saddling students with debt, and yet they are not progressing. I mean, that is a terrible, that's a sin. Okay, any more? Question, comment, criticisms? <laughs> okay, I think uh, we're almost exactly on time, as, and I'll point that out to the chairman, that, uh, um, <coughs> so that we don't run over or anything like that. But anyway, uh, thanks, David and Susan, and uh, we'll break now and head for the lunch. Hey, you got the <laughs> Take hold. <laughs>
We were asked to address four questions. Uh, what would your group add to the revised timeline, which we all had? What would your group delete from the revised timeline? In our discussion, we basically combined those two questions. Uh, the third question was, what recommendations does your group have regarding the development of consensus on the statewide education, higher education goals? And four, what recommendations does your group have regarding securing institutional and public feedback on the potential goals and prospective measurable targets associated with each goal? So let me go through uh, the questions. As I mentioned, question one and two, uh, we combined. So we just have a series of notes here about that timeline. Number one, we wanted to make sure uh, that in the August-September time frame of 2015, there would be some sort of an official celebration uh, regarding closing the gap. Uh, we talked about in-person quarterly meetings for the uh, Committee Beyond Closing the Gaps, uh, CBCT. We call that CBCTG. Um, uh, whether they be bi-monthly or quarterly or monthly conference calls, they'll have to be determined uh, by the committee and probably the chair of the coordinating board. Uh, we suggested that there be a deadline, the January board meeting, of when the members uh, would be appointed to the uh, uh, committee, uh, and that this would probably be done no later than, than March of next year. Uh, there's several uh, bullets on the calendar that are basically the same item. Talked about consolidating September, October 2014 to the December uh, 14, January 15 timeline in those meetings. And so that will be uh, uh, sorted out in the, in the timeline and a little bit more clarity. I proposed a March 15, 2015 meeting uh, needs to occur earlier uh, because that will be uh, the next legislative session, so we needed to have uh, that work done earlier. Uh, we also talked about stakeholder meetings uh, scheduled prior to September 14 to January 14 uh, timeline and uh, uh, move August 15 to September 2015. What was that? Uh, oh, yes, okay. Just, just a rejuggling of those meetings in uh, the right. latter part of 2015. So those were the suggestions that we had regarding adjusting uh, the schedule, the timeline. Question three uh, related to the recommendations that the group had regarding the development of consensus on the statewide higher education goals. Um, one, we talked about exposing everybody that wanted to have access to all the meetings that we had here, all the presentations that we had here. For example, I used the, the professor from Temple, I think it was Temple University, who gave such an outstanding presentation. Um, and these evidently are recorded, so we suggested a catalog of these presentations be prepared and then a link uh, to those recordings so that universities, community colleges, whoever wanted to look at them uh, could, and that's a catalog of best practices. Uh, the WAVE uh, acronym that we've been using, uh, we wanted to uh, suggest that that be utilized as the beginning point in the recommendations uh, for developing consensus. Uh, in fact, it appears that that uh, acronym was uh, taken to heart by the legislators in their drafting of the legislation this year related to higher education. Uh, uh, particularly, I guess it was the uh, uh, Sunset Commission for Higher Education Coordinating Board. Uh, promote and create uh, broader awareness of what, what we're trying to accomplish here. Uh, the annual best practices report, uh, STAR awards forum, different symposiums, um, uh, repurposing and expanding some of the learning uh, councils that we have around the state. Uh, and finally, Close the Gap evidently has become an acronym that's being used in other states, uh, CTG. Uh, and so we're suggesting that that be uh, branded going forward for beyond closing the gap. Now, what that phraseology might be, uh, who knows, but uh, clearly closing the gap uh, rings and it sends a powerful message to anybody that, that hears it. Regarding question number four, what recommendation does your group have regarding securing institutional and public feedback on the potential goals and prospective measures? 
Um, one was to uh, solicit organizations such as the Chamber of Commerce uh, and have dialogue with them. Uh, utilizing current conferences, it, in business as in the public sector and education, we have lots of conferences. We don't need to create more conferences. It's a matter of repurposing some of them or having some focus on them that will accomplish this uh, goal. Uh, there is a website called uh, collegetownhall.com that can be used for feedback as well. Talked about TV and radio stations, live feed, uh, recorded sessions. In Houston, for example, on Sunday morning, I believe it is, there is uh, a head of the Republican Party and somebody from the Democratic Party have this forum where they discuss lots of issues. It would be a perfect forum for uh, this sort of discussion. Uh, and as well, use social media, YouTube, blogs, for those people who are tuned into that, which my generation by and large is not. <laughs> but in any event, uh, those were uh, the uh, notes that we made from our wide-ranging discussion. Questions? Very good. Good summary, Ray. Thanks. Um, anything else on that topic? I have nothing, sir. And I'm glad Melinda wrote those notes down so you can uh, make sure they get transcribed in some, some sensible order. Um, she does a great job capturing yeah. the essence of yeah. long-winded conversations. <laughs> okay, um, any other business to come before? Do I hear a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. It carries without asking. Um, <laughs> thanks to the staff and thanks to everybody for uh, making this. It's been a full day, a good one. And... Uh, we crammed it in pretty fast, too, so thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Good job.